Uh, hello, and welcome to my talk about making a word clock. Uh, this will be a beginners-friendly introduction on how to do your first hardware project. Um, a word clock is a great example to get nice feedback from your programming skills and see what you did wrong or did right. So we will have a look through all the different parts of the word clock and what my design um, thoughts were going into the process, uh, what I used for programming, what microcontrollers you could use to um, give this thing some life, and what you can use to achieve a form factor that you can see in front here. The matrix. The matrix is the most important part of the word clock. It gives you the ability to show the time. Um, the concept of a word clock is to have a matrix of letters and light up the letters to make up words which tell you the time. So that's the big difference between a normal clock you know from with an hour hand and a minute hand that tells you the time you have to know to read to actually get the time right. And you have to know the language in which the word clock tells you the time, otherwise you, it is not very helpful. So this is a very localized uh, endeavor. And as you can see, you get the time in German right here. Okay? So this is the tiny one and the big clock, which is 50 by 50, and the tiny one is 23 by 23. Okay, so I already told you, uh, you need letters to tell you the time, and you basically light up single letters to make up the words to get a whole sentence of the time. So, es ist 11 Uhr, which means it's 11 o'clock, plus additionally on the bottom you have two lets which tell you additional minutes you add on top of this time to get the exact minute. So it's not a clock that's accurate on the second, it's a clock that's accurate on the minute. That's the very first prototype. Um, what did I do to get this basic design? Um, basically, it's a, a copy of what's already out there. There are many word clocks out there. Uh, this layout is different than the final one I have here. And it's basically just a prototype that I, that's handwritten. And you can see the, the, the words as ist fünf Uhr down here, uh, which would be lit by LEDs in the background and would make up the time. So, but that's not very beautiful. We want to um, use something else, something that is uh, a little more laser cuttable, maybe, or a little more printable, or maybe uh, if you don't have the nicest handwriting, you want to uh, design it with something. And I used Inkscape for that. That's a vector graphic program. It's free and open source, so that's a big plus. And you would use it to design your matrix lay out every letter, you can uh, add these helper lines, space them the way you need them, depending on what size you want the clock to get. And then you can lay them out and arrange them with the align tool and get the basic matrix with, ever, with whatever uh, font you want and whatever language you design. And the basic printout is like this. And that's the prototype as well, as you maybe can tell by the typo. Um, this is a basic printout on A3 paper with a, with a laser, ink, uh, laser printer. And it has the minute LEDs on the bottom. Other designs use the corners, but I wanted to have the bottom to maybe expand on the 11th line. So we have 11 by 10 for the main matrix, and four additional LEDs that make up the word clock. Okay, as font, the font that I used was uh, Istitilium. That's the font I picked for the redesign of our corporate identity for Linux Tage as well. So it's a free and open, so it's a font licensed under the open font license. So you are invited to participate in, re on, in improving it. And that these are the main uh, font styles. And what I'm using is just the big letters which make up the matrix. Huh? Okay. So 
This is now the printout with the very first prototype backlight. So you can already tell the time, as is fünf nach halb sieben or Hubble sieben uh, in this typo version. This is just mounted on a single piece of wood with uh, the LEDs behind it and just some cardboard limiting the letters. Okay. So the next, uh, oops, sorry. Okay, that's the same thing, and you see it's already a different color. So um, we get that back to that point. But what you also can see is that the the backlight here, for example, is not perfect, and these these parts are all really well not very well defined, and that's something you want to take into account. So you have a a problem of dissipating light between the different cells of the matrix. Okay? So what you do is you laser cut a separator that gives every little light its own compartment so that the light doesn't shine through to the other uh, yeah, cells and make up funny words that you don't intend to show. Um, this is a cut on a, on a bigger uh, laser cutter. It's a much quicker version, and that's the big... Uh, version which has circles in the back. And this is MDF fiberboard, which is four millimeters thick. And this word, word clock uses three layers of that. So you have uh, 12 millimeters of, of space behind the letters where the light can shine into. And what you get is an 11 by 11 matrix, that's the, the small version. and the big version, okay? So, now we have the, the, uh, the face of the clock and we have the back for where the lights can shine into. But what's missing is we don't have any LEDs to light the whole thing. So, what, what I used was a, a, a LED that can shine in di all different kinds of colors. So, it's an RGB LED. You could use a single white LED as well, depending on what, how complex you want to get. But funnily enough, the, the LED that I picked is the WS2812. Uh, is one of the simpler ways you can do it. And I'll go into detail why. This little chip here on every single LED is a tiny little microcontroller that allows you to address every single LED by itself. So, what you do is you implement some sort of protocol, or in my case, use a library that already exists, send it through the data in, and every little LED takes the information it needs and lights up the, one of the three LEDs to shine in a certain brightness, which makes up 16 million possible color colors. Okay, so this is the little tiny chip. And this whole thing is just, I think, five by five millimeters, so it's really tiny. So the LED is called the WS2812B, an alias would be NeoPixel if you ever read that. Some libraries are called that way. And those are chainable RGB LEDs, so they come on a LED on a strip normally in a certain amount of distance. So with the, with the tiny clock, I used the, the strips, and with the big clock, I used single individual LEDs. Um, and for these LEDs, there's a MicroPython driver and a, also a Raspberry Pi kernel module that is implementable in, in Python, so you don't have to do a lot of scripting with the basic hardware part of the project. So it's beginner-friendly because you just have to import a library and it should work. So that's the, the LED backboard of the, of the small clock. We have a spacing that's around, I think, 17 millimeters or something uh, from uh, LED to LED. And what you would do is just mount these strips in one continuous strip around the whole matrix, yeah? which makes up 110 LEDs plus additional four on the bottom for the minutes. And you connect your microcontroller up here, 
it sends in the signal for the whole matrix. And the first LED takes the information it needs, sets its brightness of the three colors, and hands on the rest of the information to the next LED, and so on and so forth. And so the signal propagates through the whole matrix. In software, this is just uh, an array of 110 LEDs. So you would have, this is the first LED, and this is the 11th LED, <laughs> and so on. So, but they're next to each other, so you have to do some calculations to go around that. These are the individual LEDs for the big clock. Those come on 10 by 10 sheets where you break them off. And if you're not very fond of soldering, you should probably take a different approach than that. Uh, I used that for the big clock because I exactly knew how, how big this thing would get. But you can also do it with a LED strip like in the first version. Um, maybe adjust the matrix to a spacing that fits the LED strip so you don't have to do the same amount of soldering. So the tiny version does exactly that. It takes the, the spacing of the strip and uses that to lay it out. So you have to <laughs> solder every little tiny connector on the back of these LEDs. So this is the data in and data out, and this is power in, 5 volts, and ground. And this is for 114 LEDs. That's that's a lot of soldering. I used um, these uh, the, the standard wires, 2.5 millimeter gauge wire for what you was, would use in, in your walls at home. I used that as uh, main conductors for ground and power. And the data strips in between are disconnected in between, so the, the LED gets the information in and sends the rest out. If you have a short here, it won't work. But the rest you can connect like that. Okay. So that's one strand of that, and that's one strand while testing. So you want to make sure your um, single strands you solder yourself work, also the ones that you would use from a strip because they might be damaged when you get them. And when you make, made sure that they work, you can mount them on something bigger. I mounted these with cable ties to a cardboard and then connected them with the data wire and made sure after adding each one of those, that the next one would... This is not connected, that's why it's not lit. And this one is working as it should, and then after that, you solder that in, and it should light up as well, given that your programming is right. Okay. So now we have to decide on a frame. And that's the cheapest option I could find. That's the standard IKEA frame, Riba, which comes at five dollars, uh, euros. And it's great in that way because you, you have a certain thickness where you can mount your plate, your matrix, and then you have the, the LED board uh, which takes a certain amount of uh, space for the spaces where the chambers are that the lights light up. And there's a big version as well. So the 50 by 50 uh, gives you enough space to mount the, the whole LED matrix in it, the spacers, etc. Okay, so we now have the lights, we have the front, we have the spacers in between to, to give each little LED its compartment, but we don't have anything to control it yet. So what I used, my go-to for micro microcontroller projects these days is MicroPython, which is a great little project. It uses uh, C to basically implement MicroPython that you can use on a microcontroller. Okay, so what you do is you flash a little image of MicroPython onto a compatible uh, integrated circuit. And then you can use the serial command line to program this microcontroller. Um, it's, it was a Kickstarter in 2014 by Damien George. Uh, he open sourced the whole thing. He also provided little MicroPython boards, which come at around uh, 32 euros. And that's the version 1.1. That's the MicroPython board. It has a little micro SD slot where you can put your images on. So if you power this thing up, you have a main.py that would run on it. And you can read all the GPIO pins, you can write 
the GPIO pins, you can do all sort of stuff, whatever you program onto that. And if you reboot it, it loads the whole, Im the whole script again and does the same thing. So it's really practically if you want to switch between projects. It fits into 65K of code space and 16K of RAM. And it has a small file system on it, so you have just Python scripts that you load into this file system and it runs. It imports maybe a library you put uh, on there and the main .py would be your main program. You can write your own libraries or load existing ones, etc. So it looks like this. You import the pi board library and then you can access a LED on pin 1 and turn it on, for example. Or you could print hello MicroPython and read that on the serial uh, console. The more generic one is the machine library, which does the same thing. So this is the one that goes on non-MicroPython boards, I think. And that's the um, library you would use on any other board then. And you maybe have a pin object on the pin named x1, and you define that this is a pin output. And then you can set it high or low and make some LED blink or something like that. You can also import libraries, uh, common libraries to Python, like the OS library, which allows you to access the file system directly. So you can write files, you can lock stuff, for example. So if you have a little sensor or something, you can lock to a file on this SD card you have on the MicroPython board, for example, or on an other microcontroller, it would be locked on the flash. And you have all the benefits of the Python language, and that's the beautiful thing. You have all the available uh, data types that you can think of. You have an integer that's really, 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 really long, and you can store it in MicroPython. It handles it for you. You don't have to be afraid about uh, number overflows, etc. You can use arrays, you can use dictionaries, and we get into that why a dictionary or an array might be useful with a word clock. Um, but the MicroPython board doesn't have network. And we, we, we're building a clock, and we might want to get some time. Uh, we don't want to set it ourselves, so we, we want to borrow it from somewhere. So you either could um, keep the time yourself, so you need some, something oscillating. So you count something, and this tells you, okay, uh, that amount of clicks per second is one second. So I count that, and I get my time that way. So a quartz, quartz crystal, what you have in your cheap uh, wristwatches, is what usually does that. Um, the alternative is to, to borrow it from somewhere, and we could use the network to do that. So the network transfer protocol, uh, network time protocol, uh, does exactly that. So it takes uh, atomic clocks around the world, which, with the average of that, and then you get the time from them. Okay. So it it has some some uh, fancy stuff integrated into there to, to not um, mess up the delays you get with the network, but you get perfect time, uh, given that you have network access. And we might want to control the colors or the stuff that the word clock does with uh, the network or with our home automation, etc. So that's why there's a second Kickstarter project with Damien George, and it's a port of MicroPython to the ESP8266. That's a teeny tiny little microcontroller that has a Wi-Fi built in. Okay. So, this is the chip with the Wi-Fi capabilities. This is its an antenna, and this is a flash chip where you would put your program or your firmware. Okay? So, we, you would put uh, your MicroPython image on here, and the file system lives within that. It is Wi-Fi enabled. It's bit operating. It's a 32-bit operating system at 80 megahertz. It has 16 GPIO pins, and one analog digital converter at 10 bits, and it is really cheap. It costs $2. That's a big advantage if you want to put sensors everywhere or you want to build a cheap work, build a cheap word clock. Um, there are different ESP modules available. They differ in size of the antenna, size of the flash uh, that they put on there, um, different kinds of converters like a serial uh, converter that you might 
con want to use for connecting to your USB port on your computer so it makes programming easier, etc. Um, yeah, like the, the Remos D Mini Pro, for example, has the, has the ability to ac um, accept an external antenna. Or the Adafruit Hazard, I think, has the ability to connect a battery to it, so it has a charging circuit on it. So you could uh, charge your battery via this board, etc. But I'm going for the Node MCU dev board, which is around $4. Uh, it looks like that. It has this ESP8266 on it. And here, this part here is the power control, which converts 5 volts to the 3.3 the ESP needs, and has a serial um, converter as well, so you can connect it to your uh, computer directly on the USB and program it that way. Okay. So, the 23 by 23 word clock here uses the Node MCU with MicroPython. It has a custom built firmware that the uh, there's a link in my slides to, um, to the MicroPython website or GitHub repo where the, the building process of the MicroPython firmware is, is described. And I included some libraries to s save space, like the NTP library or the NeoPixel library I need for the LEDs, stuff like that. And then the MQTT protocol I use to control it via my home automation. So MQTT, a quick... Uh, abstract about MQTT, what it does is um, it's a very little overhead telemetry protocol, which allows you to use tiny little sensors on a network to report their values to a central hub. And this message broker connects every sensor. So how it would work is uh, a sensor connects to this broker, says, I'm interested in this topic, and publishes some temperature, for example, there. And the broker relays it to everyone who is subscribed to read it. Okay? So you could have a furnace, for example, for example to con connect it to the temperature sensors in your home. And if, if it drops below a certain point, the, temperature, the furnace would heat up your home. Okay? So they could be connected via MQTT. And um, what it also does is, so the topic looks like that. So you have a basic address scheme of my location, some device and some sensor. So you would have home, word clock and color, for example. Okay? So the word clock subscribes to this topic and everything that is allowed to control the word clock can write something in this topic and the word clock gets this information and updates its time. There's a last will and testament which allows a device to set on the broker if it gets violently disconnected from the network, the broker publishes this message. This is useful if you want to have a sensor and know if it's online or offline. And the last will and testament would be offline for a certain state. And the broker would then relay this message that the device is offline and you would know that the sensor data you just read out is not the most accurate one. And there's a quality of service also built in. So zero flag means basically just send the message once and don't care if it's delivered or not. One would mean deliver at least once so that recipient confirms that it got a message. And the second one, the, the, the two, would mean deliver exactly once and not more often. So this is useful if you want to send tiny little update packages. So increase the, the red by one, for example. And then you would use quality of service two to make sure that this message doesn't get delivered more than once. So your red wouldn't increase, 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 increase. You would make sure that the uh, quality of service is at two for that. It's also useful when you turn up your heater. You don't want to, to turn it up and up and up and up and up. Yeah. And we have retained messages as well. So if a broker gets a message on a channel, on a topic, it relays that out to everyone. And if you're not listening at that moment, you don't get the message. If you connect a minute later and you only get these updates once an hour, you won't get any update for 59 minutes. And if you set the retained flag, the broker sends this retained, the last message with the retained flag to anyone who newly connects to the topic. So you would know what the last message was. Okay. So this allows us to switch MQTT devices and switch my 
word clock on the home on, on the home automation, and it allows also for bidirectional communication. So you would have one topic to communicate back, for example. Yeah. So my home automation of choice is Home Assistant, and the word clock looks like this in the user interface. So I can turn on and can, can change the different brightness levels and can switch between colors. And that's really useful if you have your clock set somewhere where it's really bright, maybe. You can uh, adjust the brightness automatically on a, on a light brightness sensor that you have connected somewhere else in your home automation. So the word clock could uh, take a brightness sensor from maybe uh, the state of the sun, so you could just get, is the sun up or down? Or you could use a brightness sensor that gives you real lumens and adjust the brightness level to that. Okay, back to the word clock. So we have now mounted all the strips on our word clock. And we have the four additional LEDs on the bottom for the minutes. Okay, but we don't have any beautiful face on it. This, this paper printout doesn't work that well. So the first prototype used a cardboard type of material that was laser cut in Realraum, which is our local hackerspace here in Graz. Um, and it looks like this. It's quite usable. Uh, for a first prototype, quite okay, but it has some disadvantages. For example, um, you would have to mount it on a piece of paper like I did to get the D and the R and the Bs and the Qs and the Os and everything that is not connected to the main board with this font uh, to s stick to something. Otherwise, it would be just a blob, of s not a font anymore. So, and also, this uh, uh, word face doesn't allow you to see the word clock from an angle. So if you have your word clock and you're looking at it like this, you still can read the letters, okay? But you can't do that with a cardboard that lights up a certain amount of millimeters behind the actual frame. So, so that's why, and that's the same thing in blue, very beautiful, uh, and that's why I used a different me method for the final version. And that's basically a vinyl stuck to the plexiglass of the frame. So uh, that was used with a vinyl cutter that we have at the, at the Fab Lab, which is another maker space uh, in, in Graz at the Technical University. You can go there on, on Thursday afternoons and use the machines for free. You go there with your uh, Inkscape files and cut these things out on a vinyl cutter. And you would then spend the rest of the afternoon to pick out all the letters with the pliers and stuff. And uh, it's tedious work, so don't uh, mess that up. And you try to transfer to your plexiglass and you get all the Ds and the As and the Rs and the Bs and the Os and Qs and to stick on manually after that. And when you're done with that, you, you are hopefully left with something like that. That's a prototype where I tried to mount the vinyl on the back of the glass, don't do that. <laughs> I made a mistake, you, you shouldn't. Um, and that's the big version, the 50 by 50, with all the letters plucked out, so it, it really looks nice already. And then you put uh, some sort of transfer foil, which is slightly sticky, on top of that. And with that, you can mount it on the plexiglass. And then you get something like this. And that looks decent already. So you have all your LEDs, the, the, but you see them directly, okay? So you have to use something to dissipate the light. And what I used was very expensive. It's a, a material called uh, anti-sticking paper for cookies. So you put that on the back of that, and then you get this dissipating effect that does yeah, blur the, the light a little. Okay, so one little tiny effect I had with the MicroPython uh, word clock was that it would drift. So the ESP is not very good at holding its time. It has a certain clock that it runs at, but there's an error in that. And the time that it gets from NTP is correct once. And if you don't constantly update it and constantly have network, you get a drift of about half a minute per hour, which is huge. You get an hour per week that you're off with your clock. That's not very cool. So what I found was this little $2 RTC real-time clock 
that connects to our I squared C. That's a serial protocol that you can connect to your microcontroller. Uh, you connect it via these pins. It has here. It has a little uh, quartz, so a clock quartz that, like in your wristwatch, this is the chip that does the the clock, and this is a tiny little uh, flash chip where you can save your network gained time back to that. So you you get your time via network, save it on here, and on the back it has a battery. So it keeps the time even if you disconnect it. Okay. So if given that you program the word clock in a way that it doesn't fail when it's not connected to the network, doesn't it doesn't fail so with, when you connect it to NTP, it doesn't fail when it doesn't connect to MQTT when it's offline, which happened to me today. Uh, but I had a little feature flag which said, okay, turn MQTT off and it ran. Perfect. So this is not connected to MQTT right now, but it has a connection to its uh, real-time clock and it has a connection to NTP via my phone. Okay. The second clock I built with a, micro -pi, uh, with a Python on a Raspberry Pi. Okay, so that's a different approach you can take. Uh, it runs Raspbian, so a basic Debian system, with a normal Python and a kernel dri driver for the LEDs. They both have the same types of LEDs, so you could b basically switch the microcontrollers between these uh, clocks. Uh, I went into the process of soldering all these tiny LEDs together, so maybe use the LED strip for that. And this one is only connected to the network. So it gets its time via network and has no real-time clock. You could also implement that. Um, let's have a little look-see into the code, what I do to make a clock like 11 dot dot 11 dot dot zero light up as 11 past 11 on, in words. Okay, so we have the ability to set dictionaries in Python, and that's a great stuff. Um, you have basically a word that is used as lookup for a certain value. Okay, so if you wanted to access uh, 10 or 10, you would say, okay, words 10 is at index 93. Okay, so we know our 10 is here. 93 is the index of the LED here. We don't have to know that. The program knows that for us, luckily. And we do that for every word we want to use in our clock, okay? So, es ist 5, 10, 20, 3 Viertel, Viertel, vor, über, nach, halb, 10, Uhr. Yeah? So, a lot of gibberish, but you get your time, and that's the code used on the Raspberry Pi. I use Arrow for that. It's a great time library. Uh, it lets you get the time now, and then you just get our minute second done. It's all you need. And you return that in a tuple. Okay? So, we want to show the time. What do we do? Okay, we say, uh, always light up, it is. And then the string follows. If, it's, if the minute is between 5 and 10, then we show up it's 5 past some clock, some hour. If it's between 15 and 20, it's, it's a quarter past, or viertel, as we say, and so on. And then we go on, and we do the same for, oops, sorry. We do the same for drei viertel, zehn vor, fünf vor, etc. And if it's a full hour, we say, okay, the hour is full, we set a boolean of true. And then we go on and say, what kind of hour strings do we have? So you could plug in any language there if you wanted to. So you have, uh, if it's zero, then it's either 12 o'clock, or if it's 12, it's 12 o'clock. So these are the two delimiting factors, and between that you have the index, which points to the word and the hour. Okay? And then we use that to plug it into our show time string, okay? We plug this string together, so we have as is, and then, for example, for, for now, if you take the time now, we have halb zwölf, okay, plus five, so it's 34, which means it's halb, and then we take zwölf, 
And then, if it's not a full hour, uh, that's the, the special case for ein Uhr oder es ist eins. Yeah? And then we, we append Uhr, okay? And with this string, we go further and say, okay, we get the string and we take this and we split it. We, we, here we have this separation between 10 vor oder 10 Uhr. Which 10 do we need? Okay, and the differ differentiation I do is I make a string compare, which you can do with Python and MicroPython, it's great. Um, and I append to the 10 in front, pre. And as you saw earlier, the pre has a different index than the 10 for the clock you use in the, in the, in the hour part of the string. And then we say, okay, if pre is in there, we, we depreciate the length of the word we need to light up by four. And otherwise, we take the length of the word we want to light up. And all we need is the starting index of the word now. We know the word. We know the starting index and we know the length of the word. So we know exactly how many LEDs I need to light up to show the whole word. Okay? And that's it. And then we say, display show. And that shows us the time. Okay. And then we can use set word, which does take an index. And that's the index we get from our word dictionary. So the 10 at 93 would plug in 93 here. And the length would get for 10 would be 4. And then you set every little let converted to xy here and write it to a buffer. And this buffer is then updated. Okay. Uh, so what do I have to do to finish this project? I have to try different versions of microcontrollers for the ESP. Maybe the D1 Mini, which has four megabytes of flash, so I can fit more code onto it, because I want to, want to do more nice uh, animations on, on this tiny little clock. All it does now is show random pixels and the time. I want to release the source code. Uh, has to do with a little cleanup of the code, of course. And I want to fix hardware bugs on the Raspberry Pi version, which has some issues with the driver, I think. If I set the, the breads too bright, it shows random effects, which I'm not familiar with, and I don't know why that happens. So if anyone uh, has anything to uh, report on that matter, I would be happy for input. And of course, implement more features for the Raspberry Pi version. And don't mess up your vinyl. Uh, it's not that it costs money to print that stuff out, it's the time you put into it that's really annoying. Uh, so basically one afternoon down the drain, uh, I, well, ask me how I know. <laughs> okay, so I would be willing to take questions right now. Um, and maybe if we have time after that, I can do a little demo on the clock. Any questions? Um, well, uh, the address, the, the, the LED get, yeah, the, the question was, um, the LEDs have some sort of addresses and how that this is uh, mixed, or how, how I get the addresses. Well, basically, you just use the library, and you, you connect to a microcontroller, you, the, the right pin, and then you would define how many LEDs you want to talk to. And then all it does is enumerate through that, and I think the, the LEDs just take the information they need, discard it, and put the rest on the output. Yes, they get the address by the position in the, in the array. Yeah. And what you would do is you, you need to convert the, the matrix with uh, yeah, th these can, tiny little interrupts, of course. Um, you, you would get your uh, index and you would have to calculate the x, y, and maybe uh, do, to have a nicer interface that you can talk to. If you want to show a picture, for example, you would have x, y coordinates that you want to show, and you would have to translate that into an array. Yeah. Um, so let me switch the network so that I can talk to my Raspberry Pi. Okay. So um, any other questions in the meantime? Yeah. 
yes, uh, so the, the, uh, what are my plans to expand that? Um, I have <laughs> I have the the plans to to maybe show running texts or something, so my home automation can me send some notifications on my on my word clock or stuff like that. And this is really distracting, isn't it? <laughs> um, so and it's a nice little product placement, but a little one. Um, but yeah, so you could basically you could uh, you could endless. You could show everything on there. So I will stop now the clock on the word clock. Maybe yeah, you showed that uh, it f is gone, and maybe we show show some other animations there now. So. Um, yeah, I will stop this. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, yeah, this is the demo uh, that's running on the on the clock, and you will will be able to see that at Realraum stand in the first floor. I will build them up there, and you can have a closer look. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes, there's just a Raspberry Pi on, on the back, and that's all that is connected. So I have the power in a separate, on a separate power, and they just share ground and the data pin for the LEDs. No, no, there's no... There's no microcontroller to control the LEDs. There's a, there's a driver. Uh, someone imp kindly implemented a Raspberry Pi kernel driver for these LEDs. So that's where the timing is done. Any other questions? Well, then, thanks for your uh, participation. And uh, I will put the slides on, these, on this uh, URL, so you will be able to get all the information you need to build your own. Thank you. <laughs>